Welcome back, classic car aficionados, to part 10 of Project E34, where classic 1980s BMW styling meets 1980s C-rated horror movies. Because today, we're going to be battling... If you're new to the channel, welcome. I am just your average office slut by day and automotive restorer by night. What are we talking about today? Electrical gremlins. I took this thing for the first drive. That ended horribly. The water pump pulley disintegrated on me. We got that fixed. We went for the first drive part two, and some electrical gremlins started to come up. First issue was when the engine was hot, the engine wouldn't crank. Now, not to be confused with a hot no start, there was just nothing. So I suspect there's something happening with the starter relay. However, being this last year of production, 1995 E34, I cannot find a single schematic for where the relays are for the starter. So I've been kind of prodding around in there and I got the car fired up, but today we're gonna figure out what the root cause of the issue is. The second electrical gremlin that showed up was a check engine light that happened to me when I was stuck in really hot traffic for 10 minutes and went away the second I started driving. So we're gonna be testing for that. And then the third electrical gremlin, the rear windows just stopped working. So with all that said, let's get to work. All right, so the easiest thing we're gonna do is the check engine light and we're gonna do the good old stomp test. There we go, cycles once, one, one, two, one, one, two, three. Good, so that was one, two, one, three. All right, so this is apparently the starter relay. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna pull this guy out. Now we're gonna try and crank the car. Well, look at that. What the hell does this say? So I thought the gremlins might have had me, but then I had a thought. So this box here is on the rear right-hand side of the passenger compartment. It's called the E box, and it controls the DME, which is there, and the ABS uh, module, I believe, is there. And I just started kind of poking around in here, and I found this, a blown... 50 amp fuse. Now, funny thing is, see these things here on top of those relays? I can't find them in any diagrams, and I'm pretty sure this upper row here, which you take off with these nuts, is only found on 95 models, being the last generation. They obviously had to make it super complicated. Now, what might this be for? Well, the other interesting thing I found is there is this kind of snorkel hose going down here. Now, why is there a snorkel hose? Well, from 91 to 95, the E34 had a little fan here that basically, when this compartment gets over, I believe it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or something along those lines, 44 degrees Celsius, that fan turns on and cools down the air inside this box. And then I had an aha moment, because when does my starter not want to crank over? It's when it's super hot. When did I get that check engine light code, which is basically a DME related code? It's when it was super freaking hot. So this fuse might be for the actual blower motor for this compartment. So given that it was super hot on both of the days that I drove, if that thing is not running, that might be causing the issue. Now, me cheating and thinking that me smacking that starter relay, which isn't even a starter relay, by the way. This is how annoying the E34 is every single year. Seems to have a different location for a starter relay. Me smacking that obviously did nothing. All I did was I waited for the air in this box to cool down. And once it had cooled down enough, then the ECU told the starter, it's cool enough to start, crank it over. Idiot. So for my next gremlin challenge, the E-Box fan is actually this piece back here behind the blower underneath the passenger side of the dash. Ah, screwed in on the other side. Looks like I might have to take the glove box out. Let's see if we can slide this out of the way a little bit. The second 10 mil in there. I gotcha. All right, looks like there's more holding him in. Let's go upstairs into the engine bay and see what's going on in there. 
All right, we're back in the e-box and I suspect down here is where that fan is kind of connected and screwed in somehow. So let's try and gingerly try and remove this out of the way as much as possible so that we can get to that bloody thing. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I don't want to put this brand new fuse in. This was the old broken one. I don't want to put in a new one and for it to blow right away because the motor is seized or something like that. So we need to check that that motor spins freely and we're going to test it out. All right, here's that little bridge. Way down there, I can see the wires for the fan blower. So I'm on the right track. Now we just got to move more of this stuff out of the way, which is obviously easier said than done. I'm going to disconnect these ECU connectors. One's for the ABS module. One is for the ECU or EDM in BMW speak. Gingerly slide out Bosch DME. All right, so here's a better bird's eye view. You can see all the way down there where those wires are coming out from. That is the fan that we're talking about. The other thing I'm going to do while I'm here is I'm actually going to take this whole metal DME box out because down there are some drain holes. And what often happens, or so I've read online, is there's a bunch of degree, debris and crud that gets down there and basically prevents the water from draining down and one it short circuits the fan and two it actually blows the fuse and maybe even gets into the passenger compartment uh, here's the abs unit so here's the wire for the motor i think we are heading back into the passenger footwell rock it out baby rock it out Let's grab the wire, make sure it's not snagged. Now that we've unsnagged the wire, out she comes. All right, so here's the whole piece out. Now naturally what we're gonna do is open it up. Huzzah! Here we have the motor in question. It does seem to want to spin freely enough. Good news! I just used my improvised IED, improvised electronics device, and what I basically did was I plugged these leads onto the battery and the motor spun like a champ. So we know the motor isn't seized and the motor is top notch. So the only thing we have to test now is to see if that temperature switch turns on when it gets over 44 Celsius and then tells this thing to get power and start spinning. So we're gonna test that next. Now the temperature switch is basically supposed to send a signal to the motor when it hits 45 degrees Celsius. And when it does, the motor turns on, cools down the box and away we go. So the way you test this is using a multimeter. I'm just gonna stick it here so it doesn't fall. And we wanna go to 200K. Every time you're testing resistance on a temperature sensor, temperature switch, you wanna, you're measuring for ohms of resistance. And the ohms of resistance should go up or down depending on the temperature. Uh -huh. And bingo, there's our problem. There is absolutely nothing reading on here. And doesn't matter if you put on one side or the other, it should be measuring resistance, and it is not, which means this guy is kaput. So what happens when these go bad? Well, it basically goes to maximum range, and if it went to maximum range, say, a thousand degrees Celsius, the computer would have told the fan, spin indefinitely, and the fan may have overheated, and prior to burning out, it would have blown a fuse. That's my theory anyway for now. So we're gonna get the fuse, still waiting on it in the mail from the States, and I've ordered one of these temperature switches. It's like 40 bucks. ECS, FCP Euro, they all carry them. All right, so I've got the E-Box all hooked up again. Got the fan back in there. The last important bit, a brand new 50 amp fuse. This thing was actually a bit of a pain to get a hold of. Had to order it in from the States. Took forever to get here, but here we go. Now we're gonna put the cover back on, go for a ride, get the engine bay nice and toasty and see if it cranks again on warm start. Okie dokie, moment of truth. Just got home, back to the garage. Engine temperature is nice and high. Let's see if she cranks. Fingers crossed. Booyah, look at that. Die, gremlin, die, die, die. <clears throat> Bonsoir, monsieur. Your chariot is awaiting. Complete with safety, security, like non-working rear window. Allow me to demonstrate. Ah, 
Merde. So I've done some troubleshooting back here and it is not the fuse, which sits under my ass where I'm sitting now. So it's not the fuse and these are very prone to failing and going bad. Now some genius back at BMW decided, I know, let's rivet these into the door frame so that, you know, in case they fail, which shocker, they always do. In case they fail, the poor sucker needs to use two of my favorite tools, a hammer and a drill. Cue the music. Disconnect this retaining clip over here. Take this little guy out of the way. Try not to lose this thing. There he goes. That's where my trusty hammer comes in for delicate work. And the last one down here. Oh, that one flew out. Now it's just a matter of disconnecting this guy, cutting him loose. All right, now this thing is more or less free. It's just basically being held on by this point and it is holding up the window at the top. Trusty 10 mil. Now here comes the fun part, slide the window down. Gently. Now I'm going to cross these scissors up here. Slide out the guides, make sure the window holds, which it does. And as you can see, these are the scissors that hold the guides in place. Now, why did I drill out this entire beast of a thing? Well, BMW in its infinite wisdom did not drill in the motor and the actuator uh, separately into this mechanism. It came as one behemoth giant piece. You wanna make sure you keep this plastic retaining clip. So squeeze the tab and wiggle it free. Garbage, what a waste. All right, so we got our whole new motor and assembly over here. Now the only thing we gotta do is rivet this guy in and then it comes with a bunch of rivets to actually rivet into the door. I've never used a rivet gun before. It's actually the first time that I even bought one. It's the fun part about restoring a car. You end up buying all these new tools. Make sure we're sitting flush. Boom. Success out of the gate. This thing got a little jammed. All right, so this one is probably too tight. Let's go back to the other size. Lesson learned, you don't want it too tight. Otherwise it might get jammed. Don't mind the neighbor's air conditioner. And squeeze. Presto, look at that. There's the old one for comparison. I almost had a mild heart attack thinking I had it the other way around, but we're good. All right, new one going in. Now the first thing I'm gonna do is grease up these pivot points here real nice. Using some lithium grease, slather it on nice and thick. Gently drop the window, pop in my first slider. Oh, come on. Are these even the same size? And there goes one. Now we just need to convince his other friend to go in. All right, so this one was getting really sticky, so I kind of cleaned it up from the inside re-greased everything. I've also got white lithium grease, which is a little bit more liquid. So I'm gonna stick these guys in and really try and make sure this slides smoothly because if it doesn't, it's basically just gonna burn out uh, the actuator again and we're gonna be back to square one. Now that we got our mechanism more or less in place, we wanna tighten this bolt here. And I'm gonna leave it loose for now because I need to fiddle around with this and this kind of positioning of the window as well. Well, that rivet did not go in. Sorry, I gotta do this with my back turned to you, but there's no other way. I'm gonna try the bottom rivet. Bottom rivet secured. That one worked well. When in doubt, use your foot for leverage. Smash, we're in. Let's see if this works. So you wanna route this guy around here. You wanna make sure you put back that retaining clip. Let's test this out. Success, however, it is a half-hearted success because the window will only go up and when I press the button, nothing happens. So I think there's two things. One, the motor was seized, but two, I think the switch for my windows in the middle of the dash has stopped working. Right, so to take out these window switches, we actually have to take out this whole center console panel. There's a little nub with the screw back here and there's a cover back here with a couple of screws. And then we're gonna unclip this, release the handbrake boot, 
and then this whole piece will come out and we'll be able to unscrew these guys. All right, first to the nib. Now this, you kind of have to pull up. Now this cover down here. There we go. Using this thing to get leverage on the top, make sure I don't strip these screws. All right, let's test this out. We got liftoff. Now we just have to lift this guy free. Let's see if he wants to play. He's really jammed in there. This son of a bitch is in there tight. Jesus Christ. I've never struggled with anything more in my life. Uh-huh, there you are. You got some little metal prongs there, you little f***er. Ah, there you go. Wow. Let's get these guys out. There's one. There's two. Right, time to take this prick apart. Little tabs in here. So here's the switches. There's these little guys here that you don't want to lose, these springs. Take our contact cleaner. And really clean up those contact points. All right, let's begin reassembly. These guys go in this direction. Lastly, our two springs. Wunderbar. Let's try this out. So it's just an extra precaution. I'm gonna hit these guys with some contact cleaner. Clip in the back, clip in the front. Moment of truth. Yes. Beautiful. So moving on to the last gremlin, which is more of a mechanical gremlin. The rear window is dislodged from its track. Observe. The mechanism's going up and down. It just lost touch with the window. So that's what we gotta fix. So you know the drill by now on removing these. I did this in part two of Project E34. I'll leave a link to all the previous episodes down below, but time for the door card to go. Gently. No time for a smoke break now. Ow, there goes my head. Oh, what do we have here? Well, there's your answer. Both of the tracks are basically on the bottom, uh, which means the window has nothing to hold onto, which means this isn't connected to the window. So to get this thing back on track, no pun intended, I am going to s connect these back onto the window somehow. Might have to do some Googling. We'll slay this last gremlin once and for all. All right, so here's the two clips in question. This one I kind of started cleaning up already. You can see all the wonderful goop that came out of this. I think this was some sort of silicone, frankly, and eventually it got dry and brittle and cracked and was not holding onto the window anymore. And as you can see, it's got this kind of U-shaped clip in here. Now imagine these ones broke at some point. Somebody tried to go in here and use some silicone to fix it. That lasted for a little while, but clearly it's not a very good long-term solution. So I'm gonna clean this other one up and I'm gonna show you a trick. All right, so I've degreased these made sure these channels here are nice and clean. I'm gonna be re-greasing them so that the mechanism can slide through here nice and smooth. And this over here, we cleaned up as best as we could. Now, here's the trick. I'm gonna take a zip tie, cut it, place it in here, kind of mimicking this plastic clip over here. And then I'm gonna use marine epoxy. Now, why marine epoxy specifically? Well, one, it's extremely strong and it is durable against water. And because the window does get some water going in there uh, and there's obviously heat cycles and moisture changes, some of the best stuff I've read online is the marine epoxy stuff. So we're gonna head to the car. I'm gonna slide these guys into the sliders, grease them, put the glue on here and stick the window in here. And then we're gonna leave it overnight to dry and set. And the last thing we want to do before gluing it is just degrease the window here and make sure it's as clean as possible before we apply any adhesive to it. All right, time to mix our epoxy. Instructions say to mix it for one whole minute. Now 
Now I'm gonna stick some in here and over here. Got the tracks nicely greased, and then we're gonna push the window into the tracks. We'll take a nice dollop of this stuff and kind of stick it in here. Let it fill into the crack. You can't see it, but I'm gonna fill in this other side over here as well, right where my zip tie is. That one's gonna bond nicely to the zip tie and the glass and the metal. All right, now the tricky part. We're gonna push the glass down and jam the glass into the guides. Let's hold it here. Let's see how it's sitting. All right, it pulls it down, which is excellent. That epoxy is coming out of the hole there, which tells me there's a decent amount between the plastic zip tie, the glass, and the metal. We're gonna leave this overnight, and I'm gonna call this gremlin dead. Boo! You see, I told you all those gremlins weren't that scary, and hopefully all their glorious deaths has earned me a like, a subscribe, or maybe even a comment. I wanna thank you all for watching. In the next episode, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time in this interior. We're gonna be going top to bottom, getting rid of the purple tints, doing some leather reconditioning, some steaming, some vacuuming, some scrubbing, some brushing, you name it, the whole shebang is coming up. Catch you next time, 80s lovers.